Intro music. I don't know if you could hear that. Uh, I'm in my garage uh, enjoying the kind of music that uh, I like. I'll maybe play a, an intro each time we do one of these uh, video sessions where I'm um, presenting to you the new material, which I think you can see back there. Half 15, that's you guys. Um, we're going to work on 7.1 uh, today. That's the new material. And it's out of the packet. We're going to continue to work right there. Um, adjust my glasses <laughs> and we're going to continue to work out there. So I've got my calculator. I got the trusty uh, whiteout wheel in case I care, make those careless mistakes again. And so here we go. I'm going to bring up my uh, screen so you can see what I'm doing and uh, hold on one second. Well, <laughs> you have to hold on one second. You got no other choice. Let's see, I want to get to uh, once, let's see. There we go. Well, you don't want all that stuff right there. You're probably seeing that screen and you don't need this. And you don't need that. Got to clean up my, don't need that. But what you do want to see, let's see. Come on, where are you? Oh, there we are. That's what you want to see right there. Let me screw, let's see, move my, so someone said the other day uh, to me that the, uh, it wasn't zoomed in enough on a little cell phone, which yeah, the screen's going to be small anyway, that if I were able to zoom in, which I can, let's see if this one, yeah, that might be clear for you. So we'll try it that way rather than backed off a little bit. So again, this is all new, um, but you're seeing it just like you would in a classroom, same packet pages and same style in terms of a document camera you're just doing it from home so hopefully you're all well doing okay and here we go so i'm going to get one of my blue pens um, you had the review sheet at one time and hopefully you went through that as well um, so leading up to this we have what's called the normal distribution Normal distribution, I'll put this on so you can see that. Yeah, the normal distribution was that bell-shaped curve that uh, allowed you to um, approximate what the probability is under a curve. And I'll even go over here and show you what I mean again. So you guys know we're gonna end up having, um, in the middle is called the mean. And uh, let's say there was a particular uh, value, let's say your mean was equal to, uh, let's say 100, and your standard deviation was equal to 10. And that was given to you, so you'd have 100, you'd have one, two, three tick marks, one, two, three tick marks, and as we've done before, 110, 120, 130, and then you're subtracting uh, 10 from the other side, 90, 80, and then 70. And um, 
the key thing here from back in chapter six, uh, you'd have a phrase that would say um, a randomly selected uh, person, blah, blah, blah. So it's going to say, find the probability that a randomly selected person, a, a, a randomly person would be uh, one person, one person. A randomly se selected person is one person. And uh, the difference between what I'm going to do right now with chapter six in chapter seven is they're going to say, uh, what if you took a sample of 13 randomly selected people? That's different than one. You're going to take groups of 13. That changes our strategy in terms of calculating the probabilities. Bell-shaped curve will look the same, but the markers will all be different, and I'll show you that in chapter seven. Anyway, in chapter six, uh, that's kind of what I'm looking at here for review. Um, Let's say you want to find the probability that uh, X uh, is greater than uh, 112. Then you would have said 112 is about right here, greater than shade, 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 shade. And that area is found by uh, normal CDF. And it looks like it's going to be less than 50%. So that's all old stuff. But keep in mind this concept of a randomly selected person, a randomly selected person. But before we get there, uh, I want to take a look at this first page. Uh, there's a couple key words here. Uh, the word parameter deals with population uh, symbols. So those are the three population symbols. Uh, this one here is new. This one is new. And we'll come back to it at some point in time, but not right now. Um, and that looks like to you uh, the probability of success, but it's going to be different. Uh, there's going to be an added uh, definition to that. Um, sample characteristics, okay, that's uh, sample mean, the sample standard deviation. And uh, again, this is new. So sample, 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 whatever that symbol means. Uh, population, population, and population, whatever this, P doesn't stand for population. It stands for, well, I'll give you the word, proportion. Proportion, that'll be, this is population proportion. This is sample proportion. But don't get hung up on that right now. We'll come to it probably in 7.3. Sample statistics are point estimates for population parameters. And then... Um, sampling error. So the whole idea about sampling error uh, is the following. It's the best, isn't it the best to ask everybody and get the perspective? Like, what do you think about being sheltered in place, Sonoma County? And you ask that question. Uh, well, what do we have? 300,000 residents maybe in Santa Rosa or let's say just Santa Rosa, you, you can't find everybody. You don't have enough time and resources. So if, but if you were able to, then you would get everybody's answer and then you would have no error because you know everybody's answers. If you end up sampling 40 people, well then you, we have what's called potential sampling error because 40 people from, let's say east side of Santa Rosa, their average answer would be likely different than the average answer from 40 people in West County. So it's called sampling error. And the little formula right here to find out how far you're off, uh, you know, those double legged, those bars right there, those called absolute value. You should know that from a previous math course right there. Anyway, notice that you're comparing the sample uh, average with the population average, the true population average, sample um, standard deviation with the population standard deviation, and whatever these funny symbols are, the difference between the sample and the population. 
Now, I took an image. I'm going to have to back off on this one because the image is a little close. Okay, took an image. Uh, this has been a while. Uh, oh, here's uh, 2013 when we had the Board of Supervisors. Uh, this is where the boards uh, were. And let's say we're interested, hypothetically, how long it takes for the five members of the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors to get to work. So let's say they responded accordingly. Uh, let's say Carrillo, Carrillo had said, oh, it takes me um, 10 minutes. And Zane says it takes her 20 minutes. Gorn says five minutes, 30 minutes, and Gore is 15 minutes. That's how long it takes. Now, if you thought about the average uh, number of minutes, you know that you just add these up and divide by five. That would give you an average number of minutes. So on the next page, we're gonna consider that. If we took the, and there's only five, that's our population, that's why we say there's nobody else that are supervisor. There's only five of them. So we'll use the symbol population mean mu. And let's see, we come up with this as uh, that's 40, 50, 60, 70, is that 85? Let's try this again. There's 30, 35, 65, 75, 80. Um, one more time. <laughs> Sounds like I've got a different answer. 30, 60, and 20, 80. Yeah, so you got 80 divided by five, and 80 divided by five is, take the calculator here, turn the center on, see what we get. Okay, we get 16. So the average number of minutes for those supervisors is uh, 16 minutes. Now, if we took a sample of any four supervisors, uh, commute time, would we get the same average 16 minutes? Well, we could, but we might not. So we're gonna take a look at groupings of four down here. Um, gosh, how do we know that one, two, three, four, five? We've got five different groupings. Remember that combination permutation concept that we used to have? Uh, Rn is equal to five because there's five supervisors and we're taking groups of, uh, in terms of X, groups in fours. So question is, uh, is it a permutation or combination? Is order important or not? Is it important that I have to ask Carrillo first? Is it, is it that important? I'd say no. <laughs> Sounds like it's a combination. So if we did five combination four and use my calculator on that, you should find out one, two, three, four, five. You should find out the answer is five when in fact that's what will happen. A little side note from chapter five, section four. Anyway, um, these four are different than these four people. They look the same, but look at Zane's over here, but Zane's not over there, for instance. Here's their data. Now, filling in the chart down here, what I'm going to do is um, take the data, find the average right here. So that's 30, 65 divided by how many? Okay, if I add this up and I end up uh, adding this up, I'm getting 65. So 65 divided by five is 13. Okay, so we keep doing it this way. Uh, that would be 40 and 20, 60 divided by, oh, my mistake, that should be four. My mistake, that should be four. So erase this, erase this. Yeah, add that up. That should be uh, divided by four, not five. So I better use my calculator on that because I might get a decimal approximation. 64, 65 divided by four. Yeah, 16 and a quarter. So that's what the answer should be. Okay, divided by four, uh, that should be 15. That's easy to do my head. There's 30, 60, 75 divided by four. Uh, do the next one over here. You've got 30, 45, 50.
And finally, 50 and 20 is 70. So in this chart, uh, what I'm gonna do is take the averages of the groups of four, and I'm gonna write down what my mu was to begin with. Remember that, we did that up here. Mu is, uh, oh, 16 right there. So I'll just write that down, 16, 16. This is 16 across. And so what I'm asking to do is, what's the sampling difference of the sampling error? So if I took the, uh, literally, this is x bar, subtract mu. If I went absolute value, x bar is uh, 16.25, subtract 16, and the absolute value of that is 0.25. Again, uh, it's the difference, but take the absolute value. Uh, when you subtract 15 and 16, you get a one, not negative one, positive one. Subtract this, you get a 2.75. You can do the math. Just subtract it and keep the answer positive is all you do. Subtract this, okay, I'll show you right here. Subtract 12.5, subtract 16. Okay, see I get negative 3.5, but take the absolute value of that. Okay, take the difference, 1.5. So all this is showing is, okay, uh, this isn't bad. You know, the real answer is 16. This is not far. This is pretty far off. If I took that grouping of supervisors and asked them, I'd be way off what the average was, uh, even further here. So it just shows you that you could have a... Um, if you took samplings, you, you could be off, be off really bad, or you could be pretty close or maybe even spot on. Okay, so let's take a look at the next page. and what we're gonna do with the results. So were there any other groupings of four? I don't think so. We did it all, we found them all. There were only uh, five of them according to the combination formula. All right, so let's see. Um, when we did that, uh, the result is called the population average of all the sample averages. I'll say that again. When we take the average of all the sample averages, here's the sample average right here. Remember this, this is the sample averages and there was one, two, three, four, five sample averages. We take the average of all these, that's called the average of the averages. And that's all there are, so it's the population average of all the sample averages. Sometimes we call it the popula population mean of the sample means. That's the language our textbook uses. So here it is. The population mean of the sample means. Sometimes they say the mean of the sample means. This is your new symbol. This is new. It's in the back of your book or packet. And it looks like this. So you're gonna take each one of those uh, values, and I'm going to flip back and forth, unfortunately. I'm gonna zoom out here, um, and write those numbers down. So I'll even show you what I'm gonna write down here. Take my highlighter. I'm taking each one of these. I'm gonna write those down, add them together. 16 and a quarter, 15. Eighteen and three quarters, twelve and a half. And finally, the last one is uh, seventeen and a half. What we'll do is I'm going to divide by five because there are five numbers all together, and then we're going to get squiggle, squiggle, or maybe even equals. And here we go. We're going to add those up.
and divide by five, and I get a number, 16. Oh, and that's my, my uh, minutes. You know, we're talking about minutes, units of measurement, how long it takes them on average to get to work, uh, 16 minutes. Hey, that sounds like the same number, turns out it is, the same number as I got up here when I took it directly. It's the same number, and that's not a coincidence. That will always be true. If you took the average of all the sample averages, you will get the original average. And that's what it's saying right here. Mu sub x bar, oh, that's how we speak it, by the way. Mu subscript, mu sub x bar. The mean of the sample means, just look at the symbol. The population mean, that's that symbol, of the that sample mean right there is equal to the original mu. That's a huge deal in statistics. Huge deal, and here's how we're gonna use it going forward. Oh, before we use it going forward, uh, this is a fact. I'm not gonna develop it, but it is a fact. Today, I'm not gonna develop it. I'm gonna say this is a fact. Uh, it turns out, uh, the, the two symbols from here on out. All right, so in uh, chapter six, remember what was on the whiteboard? Uh, I used mu and sigma to develop my bell-shaped curve. From here on out, we're always gonna use mu sub x bar, whatever that number is gonna be, and sigma sub x bar, whatever that number is gonna be. And the nice thing about finding out what this number is, it's always equal to mu. That was an easy thing. Uh, this one, to calculate it, we'd have to know something about the original uh, sigma, and then you have to know something about uh, how many that you're looking at, which you're always gonna be given the sample size. So this takes a little bit of work, and this is where most of my students get screwed up on how to make their bell-shaped curve. So I'm not gonna develop it, I'm just gonna give you the same result here, it's equal to this value. Uh, don't worry about this right now, um, because of the semester, the way it's gone wacko, don't worry about it, I'm not gonna cover that. Okay the page. Now, <clears throat> this is something new we're going to be looking at here shortly. Um, normal, okay, that's going to be a bell-shaped curve somehow, but plots. I'm going to have to show you how to work that um, sometime today. Anyway, um, the regardless of the, this is called the central limit theorem. Huge thing in statistics, a fact. Um, doesn't matter what the size of the population, the sampling distribution of the sample mean becomes pretty close to being normal. That means we get to use the bell-shaped curve as the um, sample size gets really, really, really big. So what's really big for us to say? Um, 30, 30 is large enough, 30 or more. If you have your sample size that you're going to group, not three, not 12, 30. How about 130? That's better. How about 3,030? Even better. How about 3 million? Oh yeah. Best. Better. But how can you sample 3, 30 million people? You, you don't have the time. So could you ask 30 or 45 people questions? Yes, you could. Uh, okay. Now, histogram. You guys remember the histogram thing? Uh, you guys got a... Um, some rectangles. How many rectangles again? Five to 20 for us. But if you had large sets of data, let's say you had 30 million data values, you probably wouldn't do even 20. You'd probably want to do more bars. So it gets a little complicated. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna to try to see if it's even normal. Remember the histogram? If you've got uh, something that looks like this, with just even five bars like this. Okay. 
Does that even look normal? Hard to tell, doesn't look, to, to be normal, it's gotta look uh, symmetric, very symmetric. I don't know, that doesn't look that symmetric, and that's only five. So what we're gonna do is normal probability plots with the data to see if we can even do the bell-shaped curve. We're not even gonna go the histogram anymore. The basic premise is the plot compares with the data and what's to be expected, and we're looking, um, of course, we want it to be perfectly normally distributed. It ain't, ain't gonna happen. So as long as it's kind of close. So what we're gonna do is uh, the data and the idealized uh, normal, uh, normally distributed data. And um, we're gonna look at a dot plot. And if it kind of looks linear, that looks like a line, which I'm gonna show you. Uh, then we're gonna say it looks fairly close. I mean, the data is gonna be normal. If the dots that I will observe doesn't look like it forms a line, then we'd say, yeah, it doesn't look like normal. It doesn't look like we can use the bell-shaped curve. So we're gonna look at what's called dot plots, dot plots. Okay. I'll take my jacket off and get kind of warm, and I'm back. So, <clears throat> where I left you off uh, seconds ago uh, is we have histograms. And this is what you're going to be learning how to do is and comparing these histograms, and this is called the dot plot, probability dot plot. Sometimes they call it a density plot. Probability dot plot, sometimes it's called a den city plot and um, 100 observations randomly sampled from a normal distribution and if you see it's uh, approximately normal you see uh, what do we got one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve twelve bars and they're all the same width and there's a bunch of people in here total um, there's 15 here total 100 all together it looks somewhat symmetric so when you look at data displayed this way, which I'm going to show you how to do, it's in your textbook, it's also on a YouTube video, how to do it. Um, it looks like it forms almost a line. See how it's kind of a straight line. The more symmetric, the more straight. If it's not symmetric and it's skewed or it's just all over the place, uh, this won't be a line. That's how you know whether or not it's going to be uh, normal or not. Here's another picture I found. So this one, um, we would call that a right tail skewed. Remember that, right tail skewed? This might be an outlier up here or two. Right tail skewed. And right tail skewed, you see how it's kind of a curvy thing? Curves. This one curves up. Right tail skewed looks like it curves down. Uh, this is left tail skewed. Again, maybe an outlier piled up on the right. All right, so on to a few problems out of 7.1. More about the, uh, the dot plots later. It's just a little sample of uh, what to expect in the future. Now, in uh, the, the next problems in, from chapter seven, you're going to always use, I'm gonna say uh, always use, uh, the following two facts. Um, sigma sub x bar, you're going to use that symbol every single time. Uh, the definition is sigma divided by square root of n. That's the formula. And you're also going to do uh, mu sub x bar, which the definition formula is just the original mu. That's what we had established about 20 minutes ago. So let's say you're given uh, values and they've calculated for you, oh, 36 values right here. Yeah, <clears throat> you all add them up, and somehow you divide it by 36, and the number you came up with, 12,485. And it turns out that the original uh, standard deviation of all 36 turns out to be 21,973. You've got that for a fact. Uh, this formula, 
we're not going to do. We're not going to do the Z formula. So no more Z. Because all that's doing is standardizing the uh, picture so that you'd have 0, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. Not doing that. We're going to use uh, real um, data. So um, this is how you do it. You have uh, right there in the middle is mu. Oh, mu sub x bar, but mu. This would be 12,000. Uh, 484. You know, this is going to be so small, I'm going to do it on a separate piece of paper. And let's see if I've got a separate piece of paper I'm willing to do. One moment. And I'm going to get some scratch paper right here in my garage. That picture looks a little small to give me all these numbers. So, bell shaped curve like this. Uh, that'll be better. Uh, in the middle is going to be, uh, let's see, where is it? Oh, there it is, uh, 12,485. And you guys know it's one, two, three tick marks and three to the left. This one here, how, you, how do you find it? Well, in the past, you always add uh, sigma. But now you have to add sigma sub x bar. You have to add this. So you're, this is where every student makes a mistake. They just put sigma. They add uh, 21,973, 21,973, and it seems like it makes sense. But it, you can't do that, and there's a reason, which I haven't told you yet. Uh, totally. Just have to do it. So we have to find sigma sub x bar, which is this, which then when you put in the sigma, which is 21,973, divided by square root of 36, and you get squiggle, squiggle, you take a calculator, so you have to do this every time. So I'm going to go 21,973 divided by, oh, square root of 36 is 6. So we've got 362.1, what did I say, round to um, the second decimal place? 7 then? Uh, I missed a six, didn't I? I did. Number's so big. Try that again. So three and two sixes, and then a two. Okay. Now, this value, this is your sigma sub x bar. This value right here has to be added to this. Okay, say that again. Normally you would take your sigma, add it to this, and get you over here. You're going to take your 12,485 and add 3,662.17, and then you'll get your new number, which these are big, sorry. <laughs> Should have started off with something a little smaller. Bring that up there. Okay, so 12485 plus 3662.17. And we get, uh, looks like that number, 16147. So this would be 16147.17. Okay, that's for this marker. Ooh. Then to get this marker, you're going to add another one of these. This is always what you're adding right here. You're always adding that. Okay, so we're taking the this number, which is that. Add again one of these. I see that number. That's going to go right here. That would be a one. Nine, eight. And then finally, this one here is taking that number, which is right there in the calculator, and you're going to add. So I'm going to take 19809.34, and you're going to add another one of these guys, another standard deviation. And finally, we get 23,471. 
All right, so let's see, where are we right now? Uh, we're back to the original problem. Let's see what we got. We've got uh, the mu, we've got standard deviation, n is uh, 36. Oh, we're looking for the probability that it's greater than 17. Now, wouldn't we put other markers over here? Yes, the answer is yes. I'm not gonna do it for right now because of, I don't know, not necessarily their time, but right now I'm looking at the 17. 17,000 is in between here. I'm looking at these mark, actually here, in between um, these two numbers right here. Uh, probably a little closer here. There's your 17,000. I need my red pen. And um, it's greater than, and dot, 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 shade, 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 shade. And the other thing to notice is uh, this. Uh, that's X bar, that's called uh, the sample average, sample mean. So from here on out, you're always gonna use X bar instead of plain old X. X bar instead of plain old X. And how you find the answer, you're going to use normal CDF, normal CDF. And then you put in your parameters. Um, so generically, you put in your parameters, which is L for left, R for right, uh, mu sub X bar, and sigma sub X bar. That's your new symbols. So normal CDF. Now, the left is uh, 17,000 right here. Left is 17,000. Right is somewhere ridiculous out here. Would 1,000 be good enough? No, something big. Oh, how about 10,000? Mm, nope, gotta be way beyond. Way beyond 23,000. Oh, how about 100,000? <laughs> uh, so you gotta make sure you go beyond the third marker. That's 10,000. How about? No, nope, 10,000 not big enough, 100,000, there you go. Okay, the next number is mu sub x bar, which is exactly the same as mu, which is 12,485. And then finally, you're gonna put in your uh, sigma sub x bar right here. So this number, you got 3662.17. In red, oh, crazy. And then what you're gonna do is use your calculator to figure it out. No tables, use your calculator to figure this out. Uh, by the way, what's the shaded region about? Uh, let's ask this question. Do you think it's more than 50% or less than 50%, the shaded region? Oh, I think you heard you say that. Probably about six of you had said quickly, less than 50%, yeah. So I would expect the answer to be somewhere less. Uh, okay, second distribution. And then what are we gonna do? We're gonna end up putting in uh, normal CDF. And so lower, remember this is my lower right here, 17. Upper, 100,000, a lot of zeros. Okay, mu. One, two, four, eighty-five. Uh, okay, my mistake. I just typed over something weird up here. Let me go back. Sorry. Okay, so 17,000 for lower, upper is, should be 100,000. I typed in too much. Okay, I didn't toggle down. Mu, one, two, four, eighty-five. Toggle down. Sigma, three, six, six, two. 0.17, that's a 0.17 right there. Paste, enter, done. Hey, less than 50%, less than 50%. Oh, right here, squiggle, squiggle. So this right here is a decimal, one, one, zero, eight, eight, uh, or what is that, 10.8, 
And that's the percentage of the area under the curve in red. So um, recapping, got a bell-shaped curve. It has to say normal. It will for the first problem 7.1. It'll say, hey, it's normal. That means you can use a bell-shaped curve. Uh, you have to use this formula, uh, this one here, uh, actually these two up here, which I'm now pointing to like that. Uh, the reason why we're doing that is because we are going to randomly select groups of 36 rather than, remember on the whiteboard that I said a little while ago, it was a randomly selected person, which would be N is one. Think about it, if N was one, wouldn't you uh, put a one right here and it all ends up back to sigma anyway. See how that works? Square root of one is one. So if, if you had a ran random sample of one, then you have what we've been working with in chapter six. So, okay. So, keep a look here, what's next? There are three cases, so this is going to be important for you. Three cases to see if uh, you've got something you can work with as what's called normal. If the original problem says normal, thumbs up. Yep, we get to go for it. If it doesn't say normal, then you have to say, well, okay, I wonder if we can still go. If it doesn't say normal, uh, you just don't know. Uh, it's all about the sample size. So if you can get the sample size to be greater than 30, no problem, no big deal, no matter what. See, look up here. Um, this didn't even say anything. I don't know if it said normal or not. So I'd have to make sure that the sample size was bigger than 30, which it is. Then I can do all the stuff that I did before. And then case three, you just can't do anything because the sample size was less than 30. Those are three cases. So some of the homework problems, we'll talk about the cases, whether you can do it or not. Uh, for instance, like these guys. Okay, so these are some, it's a sample of what you might see in your homework. Uh, determine whether the sampling distribution is either normal or if it's approximately normal. So this would be case, uh, this is like, let's say case one or case two or uh, Case three, unknown, can't do anything. There we go, I'm just looking for key things like uh, sample size. Uh-oh, so far sample size is too small. I'm looking for normal, it doesn't say normal. Oh, sample size is too small and it's not normal. It doesn't matter about anything else, it's case three. You can't do anything, it's unknown, case three, can't can't do anything. Okay, so all I'm doing is looking for sample size and the word is it normal. Sample size 36. Oh, at least I can do something. Now, if it says normal, which it doesn't, see it says not normally. If it said normal in 36, normal supersedes approximately normal. See, 36 would say yeah, it's approximately normal at least. But since this does not say absolutely normal, then this is a case two. Case two means it's approximately normal. Okay, let's see, okay, oh, normal, see right there, normal. It doesn't matter what the sample size is. If it says normal, it's normal. Yeah, but Jeff, the sample size is less than 30. Has nothing to do with anything if it says normal. If it doesn't say normal, then you have to look at the sample size. So this one's a case one. Okay, systolic blood pressure readings are recorded. And here's all this stuff here. And then, oh, sample size is 31. Woo, all right. Now, does it say anything about normal? Doesn't say a darn thing, does it? Doesn't. Sample size is, is a good number. It's more than 30. I'll go back over here for a second. Go back to this page. See, okay, right here, sample size was 31. And it doesn't say, it doesn't say not normal. It, you just don't know, it doesn't say. But because the sample size is bigger than 30, it's a case two. 
case two. Case two. Okay, on to the next one. A few problems to work out if we can. Remember, we can't work anything out if the sample size is too small and it doesn't say normal. So let's see. Uh, hummingbird wings beats are not normally distributed. See that not? Uh oh. So it's all about sample size now. Uh, mu, average beat per minute, per second, excuse me, is 50. Um, standard deviation is 10 beats per second, but the sample size is less than uh, 30. So because it says not normal and it's sample size less than 30, this is a case three. Can't do it. Can't do anything. Okay, let's try this one. Let me bird wink, same kind of problem, but wing beats are not normally, okay, so not same thing, same, not normally distributed, not normally distributed, same thing, same thing, but the sample size are taking, hey, we're they're looking at 100 hummingbirds. So my n is equal to 100. That's bigger than 30. So that supersedes um, it not being normal. If it said normal, that's the, that's the best, but it doesn't say that. So now I can say it's case uh, two, approximately normal. And uh, here we go. We can do the problem. So um, what's the problem? We need to have a mu sub x bar, and we need to have a sigma sub x bar. Remember how to find these? Mu sub x bar is the easiest of the two. Uh, that's the same thing as mu, which they gave me somewhere right here, 50. Sigma sub x bar is calculated or figured out by taking sigma divided by square root of n. So now I've got to plug stuff in. Let's see, 10. Square root of 100, 10 divided by, this is convenient, nice problem, 100, uh, one, one, much better than that first one I did, big numbers, big numbers. Uh, then I draw a bell-shaped bell 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 curve, and I put the, the, the mu, so the x bar, the, the mean right here, 50, and we go 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 3 to the right, 3 to the left, and we add this. We don't add 10, we add one because we had to find that. So add one, 51, 52, then 53, subtract one, 49, 48, 47. And now I'm looking at this, greater than 53, dot, 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 here's 53, dot, 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 shade, 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 find the uh, answer, which is very small. What's the probability, that's what it's saying, what's the likelihood that if you grab any 100 hummingbirds, randomly selected hummingbirds, and somehow you're able to record their number of wing beats and figure it out that um, what their average was, each one of them's uh, wing beats per second is. And um, what's the probability that it turns out on average for those, um, for the whole thing, you'd end up having 53 beats per, um, what is it, minute? No, second? Yeah. Uh, it, it's not very much. It, it's not going to happen. You know, the likely uh, wing beats per uh, second is somewhere between 49 and 51. That's, remember, that's like where all the C's are. When, you, when I sign your grades. So not very likely, but we find the number by going normal uh, CDF. And then we would go uh, put that in as left is 53, right is ridiculous. Hey, we could use 100 now, ridiculous. Uh, mu sub X bar, oh, that's 50. That's the middle right there, mu sub X bar. And then sigma sub x bar is one, is one. Put that in my calculator and smoke it. Sorry, that, that just came out weird. Put that in my calculator and 
calculate it. So we go second, distribution, normal. Okay, left is 53, right is 100. 50, one, paste, answer. Oh yeah, remember I said the probability is very small. So we would go here, squiggle, 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 squiggle. There it is right there, squiggle, squiggle. Uh, was it two decimal places? No, four. Point zero zero one three. That's my answer. Okay, uh, flip the page, and I just got this um, <coughs> image. Actually, stole this page, uh, and I actually took a picture of it while I was in the dentist's office out of a magazine. You may have seen this on a television. Um, like truecar.com, look like that. Anyway, what was interesting is they had a normal bell-shaped curve um, that they use for consumer reports here. And um, so that was interesting. Oh, and I've been seeing normal curves with this whole uh, coronavirus thing that we're sort of been dealing with. If you've been watching any social media, television, TV, uh, I can't see it on the radio, but anything where you can see print, uh, they've been drawing a lot of bell-shaped curves where these they call these spikes and then it peters off. They talk about flattening out, but eventually it's going to go down to zero, you know, no cases. So it feels like, uh, I don't know where we're in, in the United States. They say in China, we're on the downside here. That's where the data is kind of showing. Um, Italy is kind of doing similar is what I was seeing an article on. Anyway, normal curves, that's what you see. That's just an illustration. Uh, okay, so um, at this point, that's 7.1. And I think I've given you enough along with your textbook and the examples that the author does for you to try your own problems at home. And uh, if you're stuck on it, that's okay when you come to uh, class, which uh, I think on Wednesday, that's my plan is on Wednesday, you can come with questions from 7.1 and uh, in 7.2. That's what we're gonna shoot for. Uh, these will be online for you to take a look at uh, this uh, weekend and Monday is, and uh, I said Wednesday, didn't I? No, that's not your class. It's uh, Tuesday, Thursday. So on Thursday, that's what I meant to say. So on Thursday, um, hopefully you would have looked at, intended to look at 7.1 and 7.2 so that we can answer, I can answer as many questions as I can in that uh, hour window of time. Come to either one of the sessions or come to both uh, that I gave you on that uh, document, showed you what times, and I'll send you uh, um, automatic invitations ahead of time. Hope to see you there. Okay, otherwise, see you on Tuesday.